Throughout history, Christians felt they had the God-given right to expansion. Their purpose? To spread their religion and prosper. Their lifestyle was strict, and their beliefs were strong. Superstition guided their actions. So when this security was challenged, chaos ensued. The Crucible details the story of the Salem Witch Trials, a series of unfortunate deaths in the 1680s based around the conspiracy of witchcraft. Its author, Arthur Miller, relays the historical event similar to his own personal experience with the mass paranoia and unjust convictions. When a group of girls were caught dancing in the woods, a punishable crime, they went on a spree of condemning townsfolk of witchcraft in hopes of evading consequences and stirring suspicions. In response to the hysteria, Reverend John Hale was called upon to determine the authenticity of the girls' accusations. His ruling was that it was indeed the doing of witchcraft. John Hale is an interesting character. As the play progresses, we follow Hale's battle against Salem's judiciaries and, quite frankly, his own conflicting morality. He's motivated by the guilt of his actions, something we can all relate to. Arthur Miller uses Hale to show us a psychological perspective of how personal ideas and guilt can conflict with group consensus in the presence of groupthink. What is groupthink? My colleague Will Kenton of Investopedia describes it as a sort of phenomenon where potential problems are overlooked in order to preserve group conformity. Most of the time, this idea arises from stressful situations and can actually lead to pressuring individuals into believing certain opinions and preventing the spread of new ones. Within the Crucible, we see John Hale struggle with his own Crucible, one which involves the pressure of others and the repressment of his own opinions, two very important factors of groupthink. Arthur Miller introduces John Hale as an ally of the court. Well then, I bid you good night. Mr. Hale, I do believe you are suspecting me somewhat, are you not? Goody Proctor, I do not judge you. My duty is to add what I may to the godly wisdom of the court. I pray you both good health and good fortune. Here we see Hale has just ended his interrogation of the Proctor household and is responding to Goody Proctor's question of whether or not he finds anything suspicious there. The scene reveals that earlier on in his time in Salem, Hale views himself as a servant of the court. When he speaks of the court's godly wisdom, we can assume that he believes the court is all-knowing and rules through the words of God. He does not think to, uh, to question the words of the court because he does not see himself in a position to do so. He is, like he said, just a servant. Hale has been chained to the town's groupthink ideology and will be tested to see if his allegiance is more powerful than his morals. As the plot thickens, we could clearly see some of the materialistic obstacles blocking Hale's path. Not come to church? I, I have no love for Mr. Paris. It is no secret, but God I surely love. He plow on Sunday, sir. Plow on Sunday? I think it'd be evidence, John. I'm an official of the court. I cannot keep it. I, I have once or twice plowed on Sunday. I have three children, sir, and until last year, my land gave little. You'll find other Christians that do plow on Sunday, if the truth be known. Your Honor, I cannot think you may judge the man on such evidence. Hale attempts to defend Proctor when compelling evidence came to light. The evidence being, he plow on Sunday. Hale is pleading with Danforth that this evidence is not sufficient. Danforth is one of the biggest obstacles for Hale, as he stands in the way of Hale righting his wrongs. Danforth does this by persisting down the path of the witch trials instead of succumbing to reason. The subjection to reason is exactly what Hale is fighting to avoid, for throughout the play, he struggles to find the importance of thinking for oneself instead of mindlessly following those in power. But Hale doesn't just face the adversity of others, he also is tested introspectively. Excellency, a moment. I think this goes to the heart of the matter. It surely does. I cannot say he is an honest man. I know him little, but in all justice, sir, a claim so weighty cannot be argued by a farmer. In God's name, sir, stop here. Send him home 
and let him come again with a lawyer. Now look you, Mr. Hale. Excellency, I have signed 72 death warrants. I am a minister of the Lord, and I dare not take a life without there be a proof so immaculate. No slightest qualm of conscience may doubt it. When John Proctor has come to the court with proof of that the girls have been faking their spirited attacks, Hale responds with the plea of worry. Danforth is unsupportive of pursuing the evidence, but Hale makes it clear that this is an important topic to discuss. John Hale's loyalty to the judicial system is continuously tested throughout the play, as well as his trust to those that represent it. It's clear that sentencing town folk to death has taken a great toll on Hale's mental resolve. So, when evidence that could disprove the trials is found, he is adamant to dig deep into the issue. Although he has a sense of duty toward the court and the upkeep of the laws of the Lord, he cannot help but realize that his actions in court are somewhat contrary to the words of God. This dilemma forces Hale to either commit to his previous accusations and proceed with the trials to save himself, just as the other officials have done, or attempt to amend his mistakes and challenge the system. At this point in the play, Miller makes it very clear what John Hale's crucible is. What do you want of me? Goody Proctor, I have gone this three months like our Lord into the wilderness. I have sought a Christian way for damnations doubled on a minister who counsels men to lie. It is no lie. You cannot speak of lies. It is a lie. I'll hear no more of that. Let you not mistake your duty as I mistook my own. I came into this village like a bridegroom to his beloved, bearing gifts of high religion, the very crowns of holy law I brought, and what I touched with my bright confidence, it died. And where I turned the eye of my great faith, blood flowed up. Hale goes through a psychological crucible. At the beginning, Hale came to Salem as a medium of God. Salem trusted his word, as he was well known for his experience with witches. Throughout the play, we watch Hale slowly lose his faith in the witch hunts. Other conspirators of the witch trials, as well as his own traditional values, attempt to keep him as a pawn of the town's hysterical groupthink. But in this moment, Hale finally proclaims to the audience his faults of participating in the witch hunts. His guilt has overcome him in totality. Guilt plays an interesting role in Hale's crucible. It seems to be a defining factor of the choices he makes. According to W.J. Robinson of the National Library of Medicine, guilt results in an uncomfortable feeling from the contemplation of past actions. The best way to rid oneself of this guilt is to take reparative action to help those that have been harmed. Mr. Hale, have you preached in Andover this month? Thank God they have no need for me in Andover. You baffle me, sir. Why have you returned here? Why, it is all simple. I come to do the devil's work. I come to counsel Christians. They should belie themselves. There is blood on my head! Can you not see the blood on my head? This statement marks reform in Reverend Hale's character. Over his three-month period away from Salem, he has had time to consider his actions. After he has learned his lesson and the court's corruption has led to the death sentences of multiple innocent people, he takes upon himself to relieve his boiling guilt and venture back to Salem. This action of returning to the town to right his wrongs proves that Hale has learned his lesson and passed his crucible. He has returned with the MacGuffin of knowledge and plans to use it to possibly save some of the townsfolk from hanging. And where I turned the eye of my great faith, blood flowed up. Beware, Goody Proctor. Cleave to no faith when faith brings blood. It is mistaken law that leads you to sacrifice. Life, woman, life is God's most precious gift. No principle, however glorious, may justify the taking of it. I beg you, woman, prevail upon your husband to confess. Let him give his lie. 
for it may be well that God damns a liar less than he that throws his life away for pride. When Hale explains this concept of his to Elizabeth, he's attempting to convince her of the corruption of the court, as well as the value of life. His personality has changed from one of vindication to one of reprimanding. He wishes to right his wrongs, and he has logically deduced that even though the court is doing God's work, it is unholy for them to take the lives of others or damn them to lie. Through his crucible, John Hale learns that authoritative figures can be flawed, and that one must take it upon themselves to interpret the word of God. For those in power cannot interpret it any better than oneself. Hale has broken out of the shell of groupthink and succeeded in his path to spiritual clarity and enlightenment. You have confessed yourself to witchcraft, and that speaks a wish to come to heaven's side. And we will bless you, Tichuba. Oh, God bless you, Mr. Hale. You are God's instruments put in our hands to discover the devil's agents among us. You are selected, Tichuba. You are chosen to help us cleanse our village. So speak utterly, Tichuba. Turn your back on him and face God. Face God, Tichuba, and God will protect you. By analyzing scenes such as this one, as well as where Hale ended up in the Crucible's conclusion, timeless information can be extracted. Hale, in a position of power as reverend, pressures Tichuba into groupthink by convincing her to confess to witchcraft. He claims that if she conforms to God's will, she'll be protected from danger. This is a tactic that is used with groupthink to weaken an individual's will so that they too will join the groupthink. Tichuba soon confesses to Hale because she sees no other way out of trouble. Tichuba, rather than actually being a witch, conform to authority to avoid punishment. Authority figures, such as Hale, have a profound effect over others that can result in groupthink. In order to avoid an event like the Salem Witch Trials from happening again, one must hold firm against the influence of an authoritative figure when being questioned and learn to interpret the world for themselves. Goody Proctor. <laughs> Give me a second. I actually can't see it. Sorry. Whenever you're ready. I just pushed it on the door. I'm back in here. Go. Okay, just stop. Um, to counsel Christians, they should belie themselves. There is blood on my head! Can you not see the blood? Stop looking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mambo number five. <laughs> All right.